all right, Vlasta, since you've given me uh, permission to ask you about Zizek, I would love to. Um, so I was thinking where to where to ask about, and I realized you... No, listen, so, so you can, yeah, ask, and I will answer something, and then we later decide whether it goes or not. Because of, of course, of... Yeah, that's totally fine. In fact, I, I the whole podcast, any part you want me to leave out, we can leave out. There's no... Certainly, we can, we can do that. Um, so I was thinking, okay, where do I start? I mean... You're firstly a philosopher of science, but then, but then I realized that a lot of your work is also in uh, epistemology, and Zizek mm -hmm. has some interesting takes on epistemology. Uh, so let's not discuss like his whole all of his like quantum mechanics, ontology. That's that stuff. It's it's interesting, but you know, pertaining to your work, I think his epistemology is what's what's more uh, more uh, apt. Let's say. So this is from his paper, which I read a while back. It's uh, it's called Philosophy, Science, Capitalism, and Truth. And in the abstract, and just for the listener, I'll, I'll read this out. He he claims that uh, it's it, it is easy to show that modern science itself relies on a series of philosophical propositions. And then he says, second, uh, what accounts for the role of science in our world is is its link with capitalism. And then he says, third, we should distinguish between uh, knowledge and truth. Uh, not only philosophy, uh, other discourses like Marxism or psychoanalysis uh, also practice a notion of truth, which cannot be reduced to mere knowledge. So my first question just on that bit of the abstract would be, uh, do you believe there are other discourses that give us truth, not just knowledge, but fundamental truth, uh, outside of science of course the question is which which so so if we are see, um, seeking for some truth about ourselves can that be generalized to that we claim that this is science or can we say that it's such a rigid method that it's science probably not uh, making normative philosophical claims and so forth there is this big discussion whether this is science or not, but it is something, some maybe maxims, so some principles according to which we would like to behave and, and to, to function. Uh, but what I find more um, relatable in Zizek's work uh, is uh, this other comment that he makes about um, capitalism and how science was through history and also to now till uh, nowadays um, benefit uh, uh, the uh, privileged groups yeah. and benefited the privileged narrative and was also nowadays it's also funded also in the past uh, but the, the, the public opinion always influenced science and politics influenced science but science on the other hand and that's also what Rizek mentions in this paper science on the other hand also influences back public opinion and influences back uh, politics because it does still tell us something which is supposed to be um, uh, uh, more or less objective uh, and it is still the best we got <laughs> uh, still the, and, and the best we also have uh, so so uh, uh, this uh, so then there is this high expectation from science to also critically reflect uh, about the current situation and to, to try to improve it uh, and that's all great and then but then I would like to add the third layer that if you think about the the practices that scientists are actually having within the community these practices are sometimes even worse than capitalist practices in companies so are maybe even even more outdated and even more rigid in the structure, in this, what we mentioned, this uh, masculine, uh, toxic environment in I which it operates, that's... because there is less regulation about the communication culture. And there is a lot of, we, on the one hand, call it academic freedom, and it's really great. But on the other hand, it can be used as a gatekeeper uh, uh, to, 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 so that the old structure still prevails and that uh, some old figures are still there. Uh, and yeah, that I forgot to mention before, but with, with this question of, of, the, of the gender balance in science, uh, 
and that of course there is uh, also strong sexual harassment in science and nobody speaks about it and i mean now we are starting to open and and to be more aware of it uh, but uh, uh, there is a high hope and then there is a problem uh, coming from within the community uh, and also coming externally to the community through this publish or perish paradigm uh, that's imposed to scientists and that has something to do with capitalism, of course. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, you, my, in fact, that was my next question because I was going to ask, you know, between your work on epistemic attitudes uh, and our scientific epistemology and then Zizek's more speculative claim that science can be a domain to advance capitalist ideology or, or in, in, okay, the patriarchal ideology for that matter. And, and it, I'm assuming you would agree with him on that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And All definitely right. the technology of the love technology <laughs> and, and it's great that we have it, but uh, of course it is often uh, used and abused in these commercial ways. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, this probably even uh, goes back to the work uh, kind of like on like scientific funding, like what what projects get funded. And some of these projects are funded by private companies and private corporations. I mean, it can, there have been, I've read many stories. I can't think of any uh, off the top of my mind, but uh, there are many stories of even scandals where there's been bias in certain studies because it was funded by a certain organization yes. and whatnot. Yep, certainly. Alrighty, now let's but get to a. It's nice oh. still to, to to give some benefit, also something to say something positive about scientists. Of course, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, motivates them. Yeah. Just, I mean, we are being critical out of love, yeah. right? Like, I mean, I, I, you know, this in no way, in no way, we are. I'll be saying that scientists are the same as like like some I don't know some politician in in Texas, you know, like it's. It's not that we're not putting them on the same uh, playing field, but sorry, go ahead, Evlasta. Yeah. Yes, I think often when you when you talk to them, they actually will tell you some noble motivation that they had to uh, behind uh, that they had to become scientists and dedicate so much time and energy to science, even though it's maybe not bringing as much money as some job in industry would bring. And and actually, and people in who work in biology would say, okay, we would like to cure this disease, or we would like to um, produce uh, uh, more efficient crops so that uh, uh, more people uh, get food on their table. And uh, usually, it's actually to to better something and to help the humanity. And it's not like in these movies uh, where their portrait is some. Um, uh, eccentric evil villains. Evil villains. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. I mean, and, and I don't like this prejudice, and I think that also uh, is imposed in 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 school context that uh, uh, people who are interested in 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 science or uh, or in some of, uh, of these intellectual disciplines are are usually marked as kind of awkward. That is something very wrong. I think scientists can be super communicative. Uh, they they can. Uh, express themselves in very flamboyant ways and that should be encouraged absolutely i mean i'm so glad you brought that up this goes back to the uh you know when we were discussing your paper on uh, linguistic injustice it's it seems to me a lot of the problem tends to be it's not even per se you know like your background your gender race it's more about these preconceived notions or caricatures of who we are who we have in mind that a the ideal scientist should be and then anything that falls off that ideal is like, oh, this person's, you know, not 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 really that. And and again, this is probably why Zizek has this fame in 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 popular culture because he, is, of course, he's an eccentric kind of guy, but also he comes off not as a typical philosopher, you know, you'd think, you know, call it up and talking in abstruse terms, no one understands. Um, I find that I, I certainly agree with that. Okay, this one, I I I I I don't know if it's okay if I read this bit out, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts on this would be. I'll, I'll share my screen because it's a bit of a mouthful of uh, Lester here. Yeah, so this is not from one of Zizek's popular books, but I found this was quite a good. Uh, except on like more for like his metaphysical speculations of, of what science is. So I'll just read it out for the listener. Uh, this is from Zizek's book, uh, uh, Did Somebody Say Totalitarianism uh, from 2002? And he goes, the most fundamental way reality appears to us, the most fundamental way we experience what really counts as actually existing is always already 
presupposed in our judgments of what really is. The transcendental level was indicated by Kuhn himself when in the structure of scientific revolutions, he claimed that the shift in a scientific is less more than a mere shift in our external perspective on or perception of reality, but less than our actually creating another new reality. The standard distinction between the social or psychological content, con contingent conditions uh, of a scientific in invention and its objective truth value falls short here. The least one can say about it is that the very distinction between the empirical contingent socio-psychological genesis of a certain scientific formation and its objective truth value independent of the conditions of this genesis already presupposes a set of distinctions between genesis and truth values, etc., which are by no means self-evident. So I, I really like that excerpt. And again, because you, you approach your philosophy more empirically, not, you know, the way he writes very speculatively. I'm just wondering, uh, well, as a philosopher of science, what your thoughts on that little bit is by Zizek. I must admit that I'm not, I, I'm a little bit fearful that I might uh, misinterpret it. So what I could say is that I uh, um, think that we never exit out of our own positionality or that it's really hard. So we might try to extend it, to extend our perspective and th that we are training ourselves to be more open and to expose ourselves to new things and to different methods and the more methods we know or the more methods are tested on one problem this uh, the plurality of methods or the triangulation uh, the more um, robust results we are getting uh, but uh, especially in and, and of course there are different scientific disciplines which have more or less reliable results and even in math which we would think as paradigmatically something as most reliable, it does happen uh, that uh, the research, uh, the, the, for also pragmatic reasons, so somebody submits certain proofs to a journal, but this person is not famous, doesn't come from a famous place, uh, the editor uh, finds it suspicious and doesn't bother further. And maybe this result was great, maybe it wasn't, but... Uh, these uh, uh, social factors play a role and they do also help us in a sense to be pragmatic and, and they are in a sense our heuristics uh, that we uh, reason quickly, that we make good decisions and they're usually reliable, but not always, <laughs> uh, which is an additional problem. But in humanities, it matters a lot what is our positionality. And it relates us to this first question, which even in, 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 in natural sciences, which topics are we going to explore? So if someone comes from the global south, then this person is maybe more motivated to explore the diseases that are uh, 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 pressing uh, from in that community. But then there is no funding and, uh, and other problems occur. But it makes... Um, and, and in, in natural science, sorry, in social sciences and humanities, or I usually cluster them together. <laughs> that is again coming from my positionality because in my country they would consider them together. <laughs> uh, but uh, in some other context, they would differentiate them. And then you really see okay, this is so um, influential, your positionality is so influential to how you will think and which questions you will ask. And maybe uh, 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 the last uh, comment, also from this paper on linguistic injustice, this was a speculative example that I made. And that's that uh, uh, you, uh, the, 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 the way how I learned articles in English, <laughs> and in, in Slavic languages, there are no articles. Uh, wow. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I see your, your surprise. The same, my American friend was very surprised by that. And he asked me, well, how then do you say a chair and the chair? And I was like, why would you want to say a chair? It's just chair. <laughs> and he tried to explain to me the difference between a chair and the chair. And then I said, okay, a chair is then like a platonic idea. <laughs> <laughs> the, the ideal chair the platonic chair exactly
Uh, and then he said yes. And then I, I, I thought, okay, great. Old Greek had articles, but Latin had no articles. So I really wonder how Plato would reason <laughs> in if he would uh, uh, be a speaker of a Latin language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, right? Because your language directs you yeah. in a way how you will think. And yeah, that's Heidegger, not, yeah, Heidegger, not Heidegger, is, yeah, Heidegger, Heidegger said very famously that you know, language is the house of your being. You know, like it, it, it conceptualizes your, your your reality in some sense. And also, uh, Vlasa, if you don't mind a passing comment, uh, there's a joke that whenever philosophers want to make a point, uh, it's always a chair or a hammer or a table. <laughs> so I love that the example was a chair. This is always the case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the the example would be a, like a common household thing. Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, that, that's... See, that, that is also, I am part of the community. The philosophical community, exactly, right? <laughs> this, this, this adds on to our point, the Jurkian point, certainly. Uh, now, thank, thank you so much for entertaining me with that. I mean, I, I'm so glad being, in, and, and I know you don't really like this, uh, the, the delineation between continental and analytical but certainly let's say an empirical philosopher like yourself i'm so glad you, you're kind of open to uh, Zizek's ideas because i've spoken to many philosophers philosophers of science uh, in, on the podcast about five or six and only you and one other person has been open to kind of at least considering his his ideas because the a lot of the others think that he is just you know um, speaking nonsense or like he's more like a poet instead of an actual philosopher but even if they think that they should still uh, be able to be open enough to comment, I mean, we also comment on poets, don't we? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, also this is this is a podcast. You know, it's like there's no <laughs> harm done in uh, you know speculating a bit. But uh, thank you, thank you very much, Vlasa, for yeah, entertaining me with that. Um, so I mean, uh, I, no, I just I just wanted to say this also as a normative stance, right? So if we are preaching epistemic tolerance and openness and so forth, then we should also practice it that's true yeah i mean <laughs> perhaps that's what differentiates uh you know science and philosophy from religious dogma you know uh, where we are open to to things that radically uproot our, our worldview even in some sense 